ahead and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, and so I'm very, very pleased. My name is Casey McCall Smith, and um, I am very pleased to welcome um, all of you here today to talk about the um, uh, about this recently published book, Intersections of Law and Culture at the International Criminal Court, um, edited by two of my friends and colleagues. Um, so we have Julie Fraser, who um, can wave, and um, Brianne McGonagall Lay. Um, and then we also have speaking uh, Phoebe Oyugi. Um, and so I'm going to introduce them briefly before each of them speak. And um, so I think the order is, Julie, are you gonna go first or Brianna, are you gonna go first? Julie's gonna go first because she's got her PowerPoint ready to go. Um, so the three speakers are, uh, I think they're gonna probably talk a little bit about the book in general and um, give us an overview of the book and then their individual contributions. Um, and then we have Dr. Michelle burgess Casala, who is one of my colleagues here at Edinburgh and also a good friend. Um, and she is going to give us some commentary and then we will open it up to questions. And so I hope many of you will raise some questions. Um, so uh, Julie Fraser, Dr. Julie Fraser is an assistant professor with the Netherlands Institute of Human Rights at Utrecht University um, in the Netherlands. She completed her PhD in 2018, uh, which included undertaking fieldwork in uh, Java and in Indonesia. Um, her PhD won the Max van der Stoel Human Rights Award in 2019. Uh, we all celebrated, that was great. Um, Julie currently teaches um, on the bachelor's and the master's programs at Utrecht, and she's published, given lectures and um, presentations on a variety of topics. Um, and she teaches across many topics as well. Um, and alongside her doctoral research, Julie was the managing editor of the International Law and Policy uh, sorry, of the Netherlands uh, Quarterly for Human Rights for four years and senior counsel uh, with the Public International Law and Policy Group, which is a pro bono global law firm. Uh, prior to academia, Julie practiced law as a qualified solicitor and worked for the registry of the ICC uh, for the, as an Australian government solicitor. So um, without further ado, uh, Julie, thanks. Thank you very much, Casey, for that introduction and, of course, for the invitation to be here in the first place. We really appreciate the invitation and it's lovely, of course, to be here with you in Scotland. Um, I think our weather is quite similar, so it feels like we're in Scotland. Um, so, yes, I'll briefly introduce the book um, and just sort of where it came from in terms of the idea. Um, Casey, please give me the signal when it's time to stop. I can wrap up at any point in time. Um, or alternatively, I could keep going for far too long. So please do interject as necessary. Um, the book itself, it came about, Brianna and I both have a shared interest in international criminal law, and we've both worked at the court in different capacities. We have an interest particularly in victims' rights before the court. Um, we published on reparations and other things like this. So we were always talking about this and wanted to do some work together. And we were part of a research center at the University of Utrecht that looked at um, culture and human rights. And so from sort of those two groups, we came together with this idea of looking at culture, specifically at the International Criminal Court. So that was the title for the book. And between us, we brainstormed a whole range of different issues where culture is inherently connected to the work of the court. Yet we also both notice that it's always a marginalized or in fact, invisible issue at the court. Now we ourselves are also, um, lawyers so we're not specialized in culture or anthropology or sociology or linguistics or anything so this was also a critique we had of, of ourselves and our own approach to law certainly as legal practitioners as well in fact all three of us here today are also legal practitioners and uh, for lawyers this will be familiar you know you go in there you apply the law it's objective you apply it to facts you get an outcome you deliver justice and these things are sort of seen to be neutral. They're not culturally charged, but they're neutral things that we go through in our practice, which follows you know, procedural rules that are also you know, neutrally defined objective standards. And so we problematized that a little bit and said that, you know, actually these, you know, the law itself is cultural and human rights are cultural and the way that they are applied is also inherently cultural. And so we sort of came up with this critique of the idea at the International Criminal Court that it is in fact an inherently cultural practice, despite the fact that we repeatedly make claims of objectivity and of neutral application to all these different situation countries that are inherently culturally charged. 
Um, so individuals come with their own cultural background. The cases raise a myriad of cultural issues that sometimes are explicitly engaged with, but other times totally um, marginalized or invisibilized. So this was the starting point for the book that we elaborate upon in the introduction to our book. So we put out this call for papers and invited a variety of um, scholars and practitioners from different disciplines to reflect upon this in the volume. And so we're really happy with the way that uh, um, different authors um, approached this idea of culture, gave their own interpretations of what culture meant for them and how they saw it interacting in different areas of the court's work. So that includes procedural aspects, but also substantive crimes, as well as looking at culture more broadly from a political perspective. Um, and I think Brianne will touch upon this when she talks particularly about the US's relationship with the court, but also in Phoebe's work as well, looking at restorative justice aspects of the court and its relationship with Africa. Um, and my own contribution looks at um, Islamic law and the International Criminal Court. So that is what I'm going to jump into today for my 10 or 15 minutes um, and speak to you all about the role in which Islamic law, I say, should play at the court. Um, so my background, as Casey mentioned, uh, in my PhD, I also did a case study looking at the role of Islamic law there in relation to human rights law. So for me, I sort of pivoted to marry this combination then with international criminal law. And I found a lot of similarities in doing uh, this analysis. So um, I think that looking at Islamic law is really important, um, more broadly in terms of its relationship with international law because uh, Muslims make up today around one quarter of the world's population. Uh, not only that, but Islam is fastly growing. It's growing at twice the rate of the world's population and is set to become the world's largest religion within the next few decades. So currently Christianity is the world's largest religion, but demographics and others are seeing this rise of religiosity generally and also projecting that Islam will in fact become the world's largest religion in a short period of time. So it's also within this demographics background that I suggest we need to be paying extra attention to Islamic law as an international community. Now, on top of that, for the purposes of the court, um, we are also seeing a lot of armed conflicts today take place in Islamic contexts. And in fact, nine of the states being examined by the ICC's prosecutors have Muslim majorities. The um, Red Cross has also reported that two thirds of their operations today relate to armed conflicts in Islamic contexts. And you'll recognize some of these pictures I have here. This includes places like Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Afghanistan, Libya, Nigeria, Mali, Sudan, the list goes on. So some of these um, situations are currently before the court and others might come before the court in the future. But the Red Cross has really noted that these conflicts disproportionately impact upon um, Africa and states in the Middle East that can be contextualized as being part of the Muslim world. And in fact, even some of the violence today is um, used or justified on the basis of Islam or with appeal to Islamic traditions. And here I'm thinking of groups like Daesh or ISIS, Boko Haram, of course, and also Al-Shabaab. So for me also, this really says that there's a real importance in looking at Islamic law as it applies or can be dealt with at the International Criminal Court as part of international criminal law, but also international humanitarian law. So the purpose of my paper is therefore to explore how Islamic law relates to the work at the ICC. And I argue that employing Islamic law may aid in understanding and implementation of international criminal law in these countries. And it also builds the court's legitimacy in Muslim communities and around the world. Um, there's also um, a, only a small number of states, particularly across Asia, who participate in their Rome statute system. And I'm thinking here about places like Indonesia, Pakistan, India, et cetera, that have large Muslim populations, but have not engaged with the Rome statute. So I also say that there could be a bridge here um, that perhaps reaches out to some of these states that have been very reluctant to engage with the Rome statute system. So. Uh, the first issue that I want to address is the compatibility of Islamic law with international criminal law. Now, I have to caveat this, of course, because I am not an Islamic jurist. I'm an international law scholar. I have relied upon international, uh, I've relied upon Islamic jurists who have published their work in English, and I refer to their analysis of the primary sources of Islam. 
I will also speak in generalizations today because Islamic law is complex and contested and it's heterogeneous and very dynamic. So for ease of presentation, I'm going to speak in generalizations, but there is a lot of contestation even behind some of the con um, concepts that I'm going to refer to today. So forgive me for those generalizations. If you're interested in the detail, I do refer you to my chapter in the book. Um, Islamic law is a very broad area of law um, and it covers a whole range of different things, but I'm going to just focus on concepts that relate to international law and specifically to criminal law. And at the time that the Quran was revealed, there were in fact many wars ongoing, which brought this topic of conflict um, to the fore and made its way into the Quran. And the Quran instructs Muslims and it says, fight in the cause of God with those who fight against you, but do not commit transgressions for God dislikes those who transgress. And it's from statements like this in the Quran, but also in other um, sources of Islam that include the Hadith um, and the Sunnah and these sorts of other traditions that also inform um, Islamic law that relates to criminal law and humanitarian law. So Islamic scholars have drawn from these sorts of statements that are reported to map out Islamic law of war that prescribes things like massacres, killings of non-combatants, protections for prisoners of war. Um, it also prohibits torture, the mutilation of humans or of other animals. They've also mapped out the destruction of property and harvests as also being prohibited under Islamic law. So in this slide here, I've, uh, as I said, mapped out roughly some of the principles uh, and articles of Islamic law that map with statues, uh, sorry, the Rome statue in terms of some of the prohibitions here to show you generally this um, alignment. Um, fair trial rights are also found in Islamic law as they are protected in international human rights law and in the Rome statute. Um, there are also many other alignments in terms of war crimes, um, as I've pointed out here, and also other general principles of Islamic law that match or align with other principles that are reflected in the Rome Statute. And I think here about also providing rights to victims and providing remedies to victims. That's also reflected in Islamic law as well. Now, it's of course not perfect alignment. There are clashes or contestations and um, some of the, the Differences, I would suggest, relate mainly to women's rights under Islamic law or the value given to women's testimony. And of course, there are also certain punishments within Islamic law that would not be supported um, before international law or a court like the ICC. So it's not all complementary, but there are some differences. But I would like to highlight there is a lot of compatibility between these norms. So the next point that I want to make is to shift at the um, to shift to see how we can then apply or draw from Islamic principles at the ICC. Um, now, for the lawyers amongst us, we will all be familiar with Article 21 here that sets out how we can draw from different bodies of law and use that in the Rome Statute system. Primarily, of course, we have to look to the Rome Statute, and only after that can we then draw from other sources of law. And here we see that um, under Article 1C, it says that we can also draw from general principles of law from national legal systems. So this is where I see an entry point for Islamic law or principles to make their way into the Rome statute system. And I say that Islamic law is formally applied in many legal systems around the world, including Indonesia, Brunei, Afghanistan, Saudi, etc. So there are many different states that employ formally Islamic law as part of their legal system. And it's also very important because uh, I go back to saying that there are a number of situations before the court that do rely upon Islamic law. And here I can say Afghanistan would be one of them. And Article 21.1c also goes on specifically to say here that the national laws of states that would normally exercise jurisdiction are particularly important. So this is another way in which I say we can really draw from Islamic law, particularly where the state that would exercise jurisdiction would also um, apply Islamic law. So I say here that this would be an important way for the ICC to legitimate and to buttress support for its arguments and for its decisions within these states and more broadly within Muslim majority states. However, based on my analysis of the court's jurisprudence to date, it does not refer to Islamic law. 
And here I looked at jurisprudence in relation to Libya and in relation to Sudan, Mali and Afghanistan. And I found that despite there being opportunity for the court to do that, it has not. And I can give you um, an example that relates to the Al Mahdi case, um, which is a case that relates to Mali, which is a Muslim majority state. And this is a case that has now concluded, of course, Al Mahdi pled guilty. We've gone ahead to finalize the judgment and they're now looking at reparations in this case. Um, but I think it's a really good example because in this case, um, Mr. Al Mahdi pled guilty to the war crime of attacking projected objects. And in this case, it included mausoleums and mosques. So the judgment convicting him does in fact refer to Islam, but by way of background or context. So it talks about um, the conflict in Mali involving Islamic actors. In this case, it was Ansar al-Din. And it talks about the mosques, of course, being Muslim place places of worship. Um, but it does not refer to Islamic principles or law that would also have supported the idea that destroying this property would have been criminalized also under Islamic law. I mentioned before, destruction of property. That's also prohibited under Islamic law. Um, and I think that this would have been a really important thing to bring in because this case was set in a profoundly Islamic context. Mr. Al Mahdi himself was a Muslim. The armed group that he was a member of was an Islamic armed group. Um, Mr. Al Mahdi delivered sermons at mosques at Friday prayers relating to his role within this armed group. Um, and the court refers to, sorry, the court fails to refer to this context or to any substantive laws of Islamic law that would have underlined their own argumentation. So it would have supported it, not contested it. And so I see this um, as a missed opportunity. And I think it's great to contrast this to what Mr. Al Mahdi himself said when he apologized. And I, I have the text here. Um, Mr. Al Mahdi himself, after referring to the judges, so he says, thank you, your honor, Mr. President, etc. And he goes on to refer specifically to the Quran and to Allah. And then he cites a passage from the Quran. So I juxtapose then his own approach versus what the court did. And I think that this strong contrast really shows how important Islam is to Muslims. And the fact that the court did not engage or connect with that narrative at all is a missed opportunity. This is just one example. In the book, I go through and give examples also from the other situations to date. But I lament the fact that the court failed to engage with Islamic law at all in its decisions, aside from noting that it was in a Muslim context, and aside from saying it sort of as a background um, issue. And so I urge the ICC to really engage more with the topic of Islamic law as relevant in the cases before it. Um, there's a really pressing case now before the court, also from Mali, that's the Al Hassan case, which also directly relates to Islamic law. Also in the sense that Mr. Al Hassan was a member of the Islamic police, the Hizbah, and also played a role before the Islamic courts. So I'm really hoping that in this case, the ICC does engage with the Islamic norms that are relevant to the charges that are before it. And I recommend that the court does this in various ways. Um, I suggest here that the ICC perhaps invite expert witnesses to come before the court and to give testimony as to what Islamic law is and how it might apply. Um, they could also reach out to Islamic scholars to write amicus curiae submissions to inform their considerations. Um, they could then refer to those reports or the witness testimony in their judgments and note where Islamic law also complements their findings. We could also perhaps include judges on the court's bench that have knowledge or expertise in Islamic law. Of course, now at the ASP, we're electing new judges. It is up to the states to decide to do that. Um, also on the list of counsel of those who can practice before the court, we could also make a drive to have also some counsel before the court with this Islamic expertise. So I think there's a number of concrete things we could do immediately to really make sure that the court does draw upon Islamic law to highlight its relevance and to make some of these bridges or connections with um, affected communities, with victims, with perpetrators and states that have these large Muslim communities. So Casey's been giving me the signal. Um, so I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much for allowing me to briefly um, present this to you. I thank you very much for that opportunity.
Thank you very much, Julie. I actually got distracted. I was so interested in writing notes that I um, lost track of the time. So, but <laughs> anyway, it, excellent presentation, very interesting. I think um, it, it, actually starting with that chapter gives us a really good look at how you're going to, um, at how the book overall engages with, with the issues. I think it's really interesting. Um, and um, I've already, made several notes about things that I'll have to follow up with you. So, um, that, so that was great. So thank you very much. Um, and now we're going to move on to uh, Brianne. So Dr. Brianne McGonagall-Lehi is an associate professor at the Netherlands Institute of Human Rights or SIM um, within the Faculty of Law, Economics and Governance at Utrecht. I realized I wasn't saying Utrecht properly with the things that we've discussed that I just can't do with my accent, but um, uh, so I, I'm going to try and do better. Um, and she specializes in human rights, um, victims' rights, transitional justice, and documentation and the accountability for serious human rights violations. Uh, she's a member of the Montaigne Center for, Rule, for the Rule of Law and the Administration of Justice, and on the management team of Utrecht Center for Global uh, Challenges. In addition to her research and teaching, um, she is on the executive board of the Netherlands Quarterly of Human Rights and on the advisory board for the Netherlands Helsinki Committee. And she's a senior peace fellow um, at the Public International Law and Policy Group. And so, Brianna, I invite you to speak for about 15 minutes on something that is very near and dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm really interested to, to hear um, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Casey, um, also for the very kind invitation. And Julie did a great job of introducing our book, but she did forget to say one thing. And that is that this lovely image down here is um, was taken by Julie. And she has an amazing collection of textiles from around the world. And we went back and forth and she must have taken, I don't know, a hundred or more photos of different textiles um, to come up with this one. But I just wanted to add that because I think that's such a great uh, personalized cover that we were able to design. So my talk today is going to be on the U.S. relationship with the court. Um, and it's interesting that we're starting with Julie's presentation and my own, where actually maybe we should have started with Phoebe, because in the book, our chapters come all the way at the end. So we really go into the court itself first before we look out at these outside relationships. Um, but that said, uh, we're going first today. So I'm going to take you guys back in time. I want to go back not too long ago, but to the 11th of September of 2018. <clears throat> And in response to a preliminary examination into alleged US war crimes in Afghanistan and calls for an investigation into the actions of Israel, the now former US National Security Advisor under the Trump administration, who you may know by name, John Bolton, he made a fiery speech aimed at the International Criminal Court. Bolton, as many of you may know, has been a longtime antagonist of the court. So when he denounced the ICC as illegitimate, no one really raised an eyebrow. But it was astounding when he threatened sanctions, uh, such as travel bans and asset freezes, and even criminal prosecutions of court officials. In his speech, he went on to say, quote, we will let the ICC die on its own. After all, for all intents and purposes, the ICC is already dead to us. Um, it was very dramatic. <laughs> So at the time, this was a pretty unprecedented verbal attack, um, but perhaps it should not have come as a surprise. More than anything, uh, his threats reflected America's policy and culture of exceptionalism. And this is exceptionalism, which demands adherence to international law and universal human rights standards by other countries, uh, but not for itself. And when it breaks international law, it doesn't even use the caveat or excuse of doing it in quote, a limited and specific way, uh, like the UK, for instance. So my chapter in our book project looks at this deep, deep seated culture of US exceptionalism, which manifests itself in both law and policy, and how it restricts the capacity of the US to engage with the court on the one hand, and undermines the ability of the court to investigate and prosecute crimes on the other. So I'll first explain what I mean by US exceptionalism, and then I'll briefly go over the strained relationship between the US and ICC. I'll then look at the infamous pretrial chamber decision in uh, the Afghanistan decision and the appeals chamber judgment that followed. 
And finally, um, I'll link it to theories of culture and power and take a closer look at this relationship and the consequences for the court. So what is US exceptionalism? Um, US exceptionalism refers to this idea that because of its unique history, political origins, and place in current world affairs, the US should be seen as qualitatively different from other countries or even superior to other countries. In the US case, there's this sense of ultranationalism and a belief in internal popular sovereignty. So sovereignty by the people with no external oversight. And the paper goes into detail into the different aspects of US exceptionalism and, and theories around it. But essentially the US explicitly and implicitly makes claims that the US state and its nationals should be exempted from laws and other universal norms that apply to other states. So what makes um, US exceptionalism different from other states versions of exceptionalism? And, and all states have some form of exceptionalism, let's be clear. Uh, is the fact that the US exceptionalism is fully backed by power politics at all political levels. So we've seen the US use power politics in the past with the ICC. Uh, and in fact, the US has had a very complicated and turbulent relationship with the court. Prior to the Trump administration, the worst point was probably during the Bush administration when the US was signing Article 98 agreements uh, with hundreds of states. And uh, these Article 98 agreements are bilateral non-surrender agreements. And they provide that uh, current or former government officials, military and other personnel or nationals uh, will not be transferred to the jurisdiction of the court. The most positive point in the relationship uh, was likely under the Obama administration. And I call this period uh, a period of engaged exceptionalism. So the US still maintained its exceptional status, but it engaged more than ever before with the court through the transfer of accused, offering bounties for suspects, providing information and even evidence and vocally supporting the court at the international level. So it was under, uh, unsurprisingly, the Trump administration where we see the lowest of the low points. In April 2019, six months after John Bolton's speech threatening the court, and probably the worst decision in the court's history, uh, pretrial chamber two rejected the request by the ICC prosecutor to open an investigation into alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity in relation to the armed conflict in Afghanistan. And this is where we see the impact of American power politics play out. In its decision, the pretrial chamber acknowledged that the court has jurisdiction and that the situation in Afghanistan would be admissible. However, it declined authorization based on the interests of justice. Now, the interests of justice argument is a peculiar one. The pretrial chamber unanimously found that an investigation would only be in the interest of justice if it prospectively appears uh, likely to result in an effective prosecution. The judges went on to say that an investigation can hardly be said to be in the interest of justice if the relevant circumstances are such as to make an investigation unfeasible and inevitably doomed to failure. The pretrial chamber judges concluded that the lack of cooperation by non-state parties, namely the US, coupled with other shortcomings meant that in the interest of justice, no investigation should go forward. The decision was shocking to many as it essentially rewarded non-cooperation from states. And it is hard, if not impossible, not to read the decision as anything other than a reaction seeking to appease US hostility towards the court. So here we see the ideology of US exceptionalism being deployed in this instance, using power politics to intimidate with threats, to coerce visa bans, and to pressure the judges of the court into finding a way out of a difficult situation in which it found itself. Thankfully, the prosecution appealed and it went to the appeals chamber in March, 2020. So just as everything was shutting down uh, here in Europe, uh, the appeals chamber concluded that the pretrial chamber erred in law it authorized the investigation and essentially fixed a reactionary and dangerous decision. But then the wrath of the Trump administration really turned back towards the court at this point. And this is when things got scary. So immediately after the judgment, US Secretary of State uh, lambasted the judgment, uh, no surprise. 
And less than two weeks later, on the 17th of March, so while the coronavirus was really raging, particularly in New York around that time, he held a press briefing where he named individuals working with the prosecutor on the situation in Afghanistan and suggested that he may not only target them, but also their families with punitive sanctions. Um, many people thought he had to be bluffing, uh, blowing a lot of smoke, stomping his feet, uh, and that the sanctions on ICC officials were the last things on the mind of an administration uh, in the middle of a pandemic uh, with hundreds of thousands of Americans uh, in danger of dying. Uh, but those people would be wrong. Uh, on the 11th of June, 2020, the president issued an executive order claiming that any investigation by the ICC into actions of the US or its allies constituted a threat to national security. Uh, the order seeks to impose tangible and significant consequences on those responsible for ICC transgressions uh, through confiscation of property and travel bans. Uh, it also prohibits any assistance uh, to these individuals with funds, goods, or services. And in September, so that was June, in September, the U.S. Uh, announced sanctions against Prosecutor Ben Suda, uh, who's from the Gambia, and the ICC's head of jurisdiction, complementary, complementary Complementarity and Cooperation Division, uh, Fekiso Mutuchuko from uh, Lesotho. It was shameful. Uh, there's really no adequate words to describe it. Um, after the US sanctions were imposed, Prosecutor Bensuda found that her bank accounts were abruptly frozen. Uh, all her credit cards were canceled. Um, it's often referred to as civil death when uh, someone has these sanctions imposed on them. And as you know, uh, the prosecution elections are up, the prosecutor elections are upcoming uh, soon, uh, hopefully this week, but they'll be extended. And although none of the candidates uh, to replace Ben Suda has withdrawn, uh, many diplomats, uh, diplomats and court watchers have noted uh, that these sanctions certainly were game changers for a while. Thankfully, uh, with the election of uh, Biden, that won't be the case. And I should add that the Netherlands through its Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Finance have really tried to mitigate the sanctions on Prosecutor Ben Suda um, as much as possible. But she has, ver she has publicly stated um, that the sanctions have had a terrible impact on her. So turning back really quick to the book project, we had asked each of the authors to define how they approach the concept of culture. Uh, in, in a general framework um, presented in our introduction, but le really left it to them to grapple with how they wanted to approach it. For the purpose of my chapter, I focused um, on the culture of US exceptionalism, but drew from the work of the late anthropologist, Eric Wolf, when looking at the role of cultural structures or systems of meaning in creating and maintaining different structures of power. So Wolf was interested in how power structures culture and saw ideologies or ideas developed to manifest power as a key to understanding these concepts. And although he largely focused on social labor, I found Wolf's ideas very useful when examining the US ICC relationship because they reveal how I, the ideology of exceptionalism is drawn upon in both discourse and action to ensure that the US maintains its privileged position vis-a-vis -vis international actors like the court. So in line with Wolf's theories, when the US feels threatened, for instance, with the prosecution of its nationals, it resorts to its exceptionalist ideology, uh, which are formed from pre-existing ideas and carry forward by the political elite to maintain this power. So the, the ideology of US exceptionalism helps to the US to control and to dominate uh, both outwardly by putting political pressure on the court, but also inwardly by reaffirming to the US and its citizens um, that it is this proud nation that won't bend to foreign influences or power. So since the US ideology of exceptionalism is so deeply embedded in US policy and legal culture, it's highly likely that the US government's reluctance to accept the ICC will remain long after President Trump leaves office, which is hopefully soon. However, the engaged exceptionalism that formed under the Obama administration is far more preferable um, for the legitimacy and functioning of the court to the direct hostility and bullying seen in recent years. So the U.S. should maintain its um, committed to ending impunity for serious crimes, 
recognize and respect that a significant number of states have ratified the Rome Statute and accept that the best way to avoid nationals being investigated by the court is to really carry out its own investigations um, and prosecutions domestically. So finally, as the situation with the US unfolds, I argue that the ICC needs to also be aware that it too has exceptionalist tendencies like the US. Uh, through its practice, the ICC has often positioned itself as superior to national jurisdictions while carrying out uh, this mission for universal values. And like the US in many ways, it does not view itself as an equal among judicial institutions or other justice processes. So the exceptionalism of the US and the exceptionalism of the ICC are therefore not disconnected. And they reflect this intertwined reality of culture and power as it plays out in the specific legal and political context of serious crimes accountability. And they also reflect what Nicola Naimom and Johannes Plachmann uh, call the paradox of exceptionalisms, namely the universal global good, in this case, is dependent upon the unique and particular history and character of a state or court. Uh, there's undoubtedly more to come in the gripping saga between the US and the ICC. Um, we're hoping as soon as uh, Biden does take office that he will revoke uh, the sanctions that have been imposed, the executive order. But for now, uh, let's just hope that uh, we do see renewed engagement uh, between the US and the court. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne. That was fascinating. Um, I think you touched on quite a few points that American lawyers recognize and have seen in the rhetoric, not only in the context of the engagement of the US with the ICC, but the way in which the US has reflected on its behavior and its engagement with its war on terror and you know all of the fallout from that over the past two decades. So um, that was really fascinating and, and slotted in um, very nicely. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, and now we will have, even if we did it in the, the wrong order, um, I have no doubt we will be fascinated once again um, by Phoebe O'Yu who's going to, um, she's, I'm going to introduce her first. Um, um, she's an expert in international criminal law and justice, and she's been working this field for over 10 years doing research, um, as well as engagement as, as a practicing lawyer in this area. Um, this includes, she's undertaken a master's degree and a doctor of laws degree in international criminal law. She teaches criminal law at the University of Embu and has done consultancies on crime and justice issues with, a, with various organizations, um, including uh, the defense team for Charles by uh, Golda, which I'm not sure I pronounced correctly, um, but I I'm trying, and at the International Criminal Court. Um, and she's also worked with the United uh, Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Kenya. And so we are very much looking forward forward to um, uh, hearing about your chapter. So you have the floor, Phoebe. I think you're on mute. You're on mute, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Better. All right, um, thank you very much. I'm just gonna set some time so I can remind myself of the 15 minutes I have. Um, okay, so as you have heard, my name is Phoebe Oyugi. Uh, I, I work, uh, one of the many things I do is that I, I currently work as assistant to counsel in the defense team of uh, Ms. Tangai Sona from Central African Republic. Uh, and so I want to begin by talking a little bit about our case and then I will connect that to our book chapter. Uh, so, so in 2013, there was a coup in Central African Republic leading to the ousting of the then president. And this resulted into a war which sort of seems to be divided into two parts, Christians on one side and Muslim population on the other side. So the Seleka and the Anti-Balaka sort of clashing against each other. Uh, so a big part of my job as assistant to counsel involves reading a lot of witness statements and most of them speak of really horrible things happening to them, their friends, their parents, their children, their imams, their mosques, their churches, um, 
ITC, ETC. So, uh, of course, the, uh, as the ICC works, the prosecutor alleges that uh, our client, Mr. Ngoisona, was uh, one of the most responsible persons for these crimes, and soon there will be a trial to test these allegations. But I think for me as a practitioner, when I look at this, uh, this case, it's very clear from, to me that very horrible things happened to people in, in that country. Um, so it's basically a society turning against itself. It's, um, it's, and it, it, it involves everyone, men and women, children, young and old, politicians, religious leaders. So we see that when war happens, every single member of the society is affected either directly or indirectly. The whole society in, is involved. And it's not only in Central African Republic, uh, it's, it's in each and every situation with which before the ICC. So my point is that the crimes that are prosecuted at the ICC, that's war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide affect the whole community. Uh, so the ICC is mandated to prosecute persons allegedly most responsible for such international crimes. Therefore, I mean, to prosecute the persons most responsible, the ICC has to choose one or two or at least three people in every situation to prosecute. Uh, and the, I, the vic victims are currently involved as well uh, with participation and reparation. But we know uh, that the, the victim participation and reparation regime is, is facing such serious challenges that it is very ineffective. So the background of our research was the acknowledgement that the ICC, by its very design, it lacks the capacity to effectively uh, address the communal nature of international crimes. So then we ask the question, what, what can be done? What, what, um, what can be done about this? So the solution we propose is, is, um, is something that blends culture and clean negotiation. And I say we because um, I wrote this book chapter with a friend of mine who uh, called Owiso Owiso, who is a doctoral researcher at, the, at uh, Luxembourg University. And, and he's an expert in, in restorative justice. So when I say we, I mean me and, and no so. Okay. So, so I will I will admit that culture and plea negotiation seem like an odd mix, you know. Um, but it, it's not. So I hope I hope by the time I finish the presentation, you will be persuaded that it's not such a, a weird combination. But first, uh, what, what is culture? As, as Julie and Brianne mentioned earlier, it, the, the book sort of left every, uh, it, it, the authors were allowed to sort of define their own um, view of culture or perspective of culture, so to speak. And, and most people think that they know what culture is, is but, but do, do, we, do we really know what it is? And, and since I, I, I am an, I'm not an anthropologist, I'm a lawyer by training, I will not get into the potential landmine of defining culture. But for the purpose of our chapter, we borrowed the definition of the uh, UN Committee on Economic and so Social Cultural uh, Rights. And they define culture as uh, the accumulation of a people's wisdom which governs intra-society relations and society's external relations. And this includes, among other things, religion or belief systems, rights, customs, and traditions. So according to the definition we adopted, there, there are at least four important things. So that is, uh, number one is the accumulation of, the, of a people's wisdom, and then it should govern relations within the society as well as relations between society members and those outside the society. And this, and this can include religion, belief systems, rights, customs, and traditions. So in this chapter, we, we, look, we focus on the perception of justice in various um, African societies. 
And the focus in Africa is informed by the fact that we, the authors, we, the authors of the chapter are African, but more importantly, by the fact that majority of the ICC active cases and situations concern African states, meaning that the, the activities of the court will affect communities in Africa. It affects communities in Africa and it will continue to do so for the next foreseeable future. So when you talk about Africa, it is easy to fall into the trap of considering Africa as a country. So um, we will, so in our chapter, we, we recognize the cultural diversity of Africa, which has about over 3000 different cultural groups and organized in 55 different states. But as uh, Professor Juma says, um, he, he writes that there's still a rich reservoir of cultural and traditional systems, which some and some common threads and practices that seem to enjoy a wide, widespread acceptance. And one of such common threads in many societies throughout the continent is the recognition that crime affects the entire society which results, which then results in um, transformative uh, uh, approaches to justice, uh, and therefore, to resolve in many in many African societies, to resolve crime, emphasis in, is put on societal dialogue and participation, acknowledgement of guilt, confession, remorse, amends through reparations, supporting and encouraging forgiveness, healing and reconciliation. Of course, there is the punishment of an offender, but this is only a little bit a minor aspect of justice. So despite colonization and the transformative justice approaches are applied informally in many African countries, especially in rural areas, but in some countries like Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, these approaches have been incorporated in, in written law. So, Transformative approaches to justice have also been recognized and adopted to address mass violence in some post-conflict societies in, in Africa today. Uh, so they, to, to use this for international crimes, they put in necessary adaptations and adjustments. So we're talking, uh, in, in our chapter, we give the Truth, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, which was uh, established to deal with the crime of apartheid, which has been recognized as an international crime. We also talk about the gachacha system in, in Rwanda, which was uh, used to deal with genocide, and the Matoput um, system in, in uh, Uganda, which was used to, to deal with war crimes and crimes against humanity. So in Rwanda and Uganda, uh, this cultural transformative approaches were used side by side with, um, with uh, prosecutions at the Yugoslav Tribunal and at the ICC respectively. So the idea behind transformative approaches is to foster reconciliation and peace by recognizing that wrongdoing affects the whole community and not just the immediate victim and the offender. So then how do we, how do we propose to bring this to the ICC. So the vehicle we suggest in our chapter is plea negotiation. So this is a process where discussions, discussions um, can be had between the accused person and the ICC prosecutor, where the accused person agrees to plead guilty in exchange for a lower charge or a lower sentence. And such discussions are provided for under Article 65 of the Rome Statute. It has also been uh, used at the ICC in the case of Almadi, uh, which Julie discussed uh, in a bit of detail earlier. And he pleaded guilty pursuant to a plea agreement with the prosecutor and he was sentenced to nine years imprisonment, which he's currently serving in Britain. Last, last I heard uh, was that he was supposed to give evidence in the case against Al Hassan, also from Mali. I'm not, I'm not sure whether this has happened yet. So, uh, but plea negotiation has some, some advantages. So if an accused person pleads guilty as a result of a plea agreement, the trial is shorter, conviction is certain, 
there's, there's usually not an appeal on the conviction. And usually the sentence is agreed upon between the two parties. So if, if the chamber adopts that agreement, there will be no appeal on sentencing. And then reparations can, be, can begin. Witnesses do not need to travel to the court to give evidence. So basically it leads to efficiency and saving of judicial resources. So an accused person can cooperate with the prosecution to provide evidence which might not otherwise be available. So this advantages became clear to me during my PhD research, which was on plea negotiation at the ICC. So as part of my, my PhD research, I had uh, discussions with professionals who have had interactions with plea negotiation. And the first one was Judge Van, Van Judge Van den Weingart um, and, and, Mr. And, Ale, and Prof, Professor Alexander Knox. Uh, so uh, uh, the judge talked to me about uh, her time, her tenure when she was judge at the, at the um, Yugoslav Tribunal. And she presided over cases where plea agreement had been entered. She so she, she told me that it was through accused persons who pleaded guilty and agreed to cooperate with the court that this accused persons provided vital information which would have otherwise not been available. For example, with regard to uh, the Srebrenica, I can't, I can't pronounce that word properly, but the massacre in, in that place. Uh, and also uh, Professor Knox, uh, who is my current boss as well. He represented an accused person at the Rwanda tribunal who pleaded guilty as a result of a plea agreement. And he participated in the plea negotiations with the prosecutor as a result of which the guilty plea was entered. So the trial was short and there was no need for witness testimony. Uh, Mr. Baragaraza cooperated with the prosecutor and he received a sentence of eight years he served five and was out uh, in, in a short time. These advantages have also been noted by the ICC prosecutor. So on the 12th of November, 2020, the ICC prosecutor published the guidelines for agreements regarding admission of guilt, which recognized that plea negotiation is a useful tool uh, which the with which the prosecutor can help combat impunity and outline circumstances under which the prosecutor should consider entering such an agreement uh, with an accused person. So this is in line with, with, our, with the proposals in our chapter. But how does culture, how does culture come into this? Okay. So we propose that the transformative approaches to justice, which are prevalent in, in, the, in the culture of many African uh, societies can be incorporated at the ICC through plea negotiation. So I will explain this by way of an example uh, using the, the Kenya cases. Um, so Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto were accused of crimes against humanity and were standing trial at the ICC, after which Kenyans saw it fit to elect them as uh, the president and deputy president of Kenya, respectively. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, so so it was it was a very challenging case to prosecute because of they they didn't cooperate with the ICC to produce evidence to help uh, collection of evidence. So both cases finished prematurely without acquittals or convictions. So how much how much plea negotiation have worked? So in such a case, it might be difficult to um, convince. Uh, accused persons of such high standing to plead guilty. But I think they might have been, I mean, even if it's true, politicians would not admit that they financed, incited, or supported armed, or armed people who actually killed and raped and maimed and looted. But I think they could, they could have been convinced to admit that as leaders, they failed to exercise control over their constituents and, and those people committed crimes so that so, which seems to be a lesser thing then. So if they admit that, then the prosecutor would agree to non-custodial sentences and they would be allowed to, they would be required to participate in cultural practices that are recognized in various 
communities, for example, the Kikuyu and the Kalenjin to which the two people belong. So by following this, just one minute, am I out of time? Just give me one minute to wrap up, is that all right? Yeah. So by following these cultural practices, um, you would ensure that people come together as a community to address what happened. They talk about who died, how and who killed them. Apologies are made, cultural rights are performed and people move on together. So based on, on this, the prosecution would then agree to non-custodial sentences so that the, the accused person would not be imprisoned. And additionally, because these two people were Kenya's president and deputy president with so much power in the country, they could be they could uh, get them to agree to provide victims with reparations, such as resettlement of IDPs, or to commit to not interfere with witnesses. I'm not saying that they did, um, or or and so much more. So so this is in that process, it would be possible to bring about transformative justice, and and this is what we put forward in our chapter. So just to wrap up, international crimes are that. Are, which are prosecuted at the ICC affect the whole society. It's not enough to prosecute one or two people. There's need to incorporate transformative justice, which involves the whole society. And these are prevalent in many African societies. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. All right. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, that was, again, another fascinating. Um, peek into the book um, and I think actually you, you know you you said it at the end um, but you know throughout your presentation I think you're very much um, drawing those connections between um, transitional justice and how the ICC has a role that to me seems very untapped in terms of how it plays into transitional justice and 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 what could be in terms of its role as part of the transitional justice processes. Um, so, so thank you for that. That was really interesting. Um, and so now um, we move on from our authors and contributors to the book um, to um, my friend and colleague again, um, Michelle burgess Castala, who is um, uh, here at Edinburgh University and she teaches on the law faculty um, in public international law and international human rights law. Um, her research centers on um, areas of around the operation of international law and contestation of international law in the context of the Arab world. Um, and so I think probably these um, issues about culture and, and some of the interventions that we've heard um, are very relevant in Michelle's work. And so she's going to um, give comments for 10 to 15 minutes, and then we will open up um, the floor to questions, but we'll do that using the chat box. So um, for anyone who wants to ask a question after Michelle finishes, I'll, I'll open the floor up for questions. But um, so now, uh, Michelle, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to Casey and thank you to our wonderful presenters and all female panel, amazing, especially in the field of international criminal law, which I would say is highly masculinized. And that in itself is actually a form of culture that we could at least unpack at some point, hopefully in the future. <laughs> but uh, so I'll just, I'll just, um, I spend a few minutes because it'd be great to open it up, um, I think, to further discussion. Um, I've only had the chance to read the introduction and the uh, chapters of our respective speakers thus far okay but I have really enjoyed the taste so far from those pieces. Um, I think I'll just start by saying that ultimately what the book tries to do is to obviously unpack this notion of culture which as we've heard is highly marginal but as we've now seen is crazily important and very very complex and I think for, for my own work as well I think it's a real struggle methodologically to work out how we actually just approach this very supposedly simple notion of, of culture um, and how we juxtapose it with law. And so I think that really what I'll be trying to do is trying to sort of push the authors in terms of their um, methodology really, um, and maybe just offer some pointers here. And for me, all of the pieces in some way were actually comparative law pieces. Um, and so it's in some ways it's, um, that to me was the um, missing dimension here because it's always going to be you no know, culture and law or ICC and the US or Islamic law and civil law or you know whatever it is um, and so I think you know while I talk through it I think that will become clear and 
and that might be a, a useful way to think a little bit more about it. I suppose the other sort of framework that could be useful here um, that again wasn't really mentioned is legal pluralism and, and to me what is fascinating is the way legal pluralism tends to be, at least when I read about it, um, conveyed um, to suggest a very flat sort of um, lack of hierarchy um, of, of different legal obligations and in a very sort of complex normative universe where individuals, groups, entities um, can access a range of different types of normative ways of being. And of course, that is absolutely at odds with something as ultra hierarchical as the International Criminal Court. I mean, you cannot get more of a juxtaposition going on there. Um, and so I think it's really quite fascinating to try to tease that out. And I think that becomes apparent if we think about, well, you know, how do we actually deal with potential norm conflicts between, you know, these transformative processes we just heard about from Phoebe or Islamic approaches to law? Is there a way that we can somehow reconcile, I would say, say, say is these really fundamentally different approaches to how we think of normativity. And I mean, partly what the ICC does, I think it's, it's acknowledged that it has to do this, is through the complementarity regime, which of course, you know, is highly <laughs> controversial in its own right. But again, I think the complementarity regime then could be a way then to address some of these problems about hierarchy and pluralism, and also about um, maybe thinking about um, comparative approaches. So anyway, that's, that's the framework. There's some of the ideas that I got in terms of um, reading this. When I think about culture, I mean, it seems like, um, which makes sense, you know, we, we tend to um, align our notion of culture with a society. But from my own work, and obviously, because the book's on an organisation, I wanted to hear more about organisational culture. Yeah. And then unpacking the organisation at play here, which we're looking at largely, which is the ICC. And so I would point you to, because I've read it myself, some of it anyway, um, um, organisational ethnographies, um, which really try to unpack how organizations work or, or fail to work. Um, and I think that really then shows us how the ICC in, in, its, of, in and of itself is not a culture. You know, it's, it's going to be a site of multiple, diff, you know, multiple cultures of contestations of, about how the culture of the ICC is even constructed and, and presented. Um, and, I, and I think I'll, I'll sort of try to illustrate that in a, in a few examples. Um, so firstly, let's turn to um, Julie's great overview. Thank you so much. Um, and I mean, I think we should we should note that in some ways, this recent work, which Julie um, is an exemplar of, um, this recent work about Islamic law and um, international criminal law, I see it as part of this longer comparative tradition, which I've also contributed to, which is, you know, we've got this sort of Islamic law and public international law. Islamic law and international humanitarian law, Islamic law and human rights law, and now we have Islamic law and international criminal law. So you can see where it's going, and it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I'm sure we've also we've had little iterations of it, you know, and international environmental law, or etc. 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 And I think um, the problem with this scholarship, myself included, is it tends to set up these sort of binary categories of you know European law and Islamic law um, and, and again so sort of we get these monoliths and I think that we then have this real sort of methodological quandary of, of how to um, unpack and and uh, diversify legal traditions um, and I think Julie pointed to the difficulty here particularly with something like Islamic law which is just really basic stuff like you know lack of language um, expertise, um, lack of knowledge, um, lack of access to resources in this field. And so, I mean, one question I had was, I mean, Julie gives this great survey about missed opportunities. Um, and I, I really liked it how, you know, we have these cases that could have been really rich for at least somehow drawing on Islamic traditions, but they failed to do so before the ICC. And my question simply is, do you think, Julie, this was just ignorance lack of competence and expertise or actually some type of resistance or awkwardness on, on the part of the court? Like, is it a culture of the court to be able to open itself up to Islamic legal traditions or any type of um, other legal tradition? I mean, what, what's behind it here? Is this particular to Islamic law, would you say? Would it be to any type of you know, legal pluralism? 
I mean, I'm sensing that, you know, as I said, because of the hierarchical nature of the, the Rome statute, it just in some way is just a dissonance with this um, possibility of opening up itself up anyway um, to, to other voices. And so you, your, your suggestions for how to incorporate, um, let's say, Islamic law expertise into the court, I think they're really good ones. But what would we do if we actually came across a norm conflict? And would that in some ways actually potentially undermine this attempt at legitimacy on the part of the court to be more, you know, more, more embracing or accommodating of, of other legal traditions? Um, I suppose I'm just sort of, I just don't know how it would work <laughs> in terms of, because I, I myself have read um, cases more so in terms of the International Court of Justice, where, you know, again, there's this sort of attempt sometimes by judges or particularly in the pleadings to somehow bring in you know these other traditions and just a lot of the time the court just cannot deal with it it cannot you know so it basically just runs away in fear or ignorance or um and it makes sense you know these are highly trained judges with decades of experience and to then ask them to somehow also deal with all of this other stuff is maybe asking too much of them like is the international criminal court the forum in which to do this um and if so, I suppose, yeah, what particular institutional resources or whatever would, would they would they draw on? So I wanted to ask you as well, if you think about sort of whether we should have formal relationships established more with the um, Arab League or with the Organization of Islamic Conference, if we could sort of set up specific institutes or have formal relationships with particular universities, you know, would, would that help? Um, I mean, Islamic law is famous for its highly highly pluralized nature it does not have a very hierarchical system we can't say you know it's this faculty or it's this person because it has four main um schools of thought in its in and of itself and obviously then the division between shia and and sunni as well so it's if you if you're a so if you're a judge on the icc you know i feel for you <laughs> so you can't just there's no go-to textbook here um so i i suppose yeah i'm just I'm just sort of wondering how it would actually work. I suppose another way of thinking about this would be hybridity, but how does hybridity work in any criminal trial setting? Is that even possible, um, you know, in, in the punitive framework? Um, so thank you, um, Julie. Quickly, sorry, I'm probably running over time already. Turning to um, Brianne, um, this again, I mean, this is a great piece again, and obviously it was another example in some ways of comparativism. You know, you had um, US cultures manifested in, in, in this particular way um, and, and how um, the US sees itself vis-a-vis um, -vis the ICC or, or international criminal law um, and then obviously about, uh, the ICC. And so I suppose in terms of how the comparison was um, balanced, there was much more emphasis on the US um, and its engagement and perhaps less on the ICC. But what I found really fascinating and maybe illustrates how this would open, would lend itself really well to organizational ethnography is how, when you talk about the um, Afghanistan pretrial chamber decision, there's massive competition within the ICC itself about how it should present its relationship with the, the US. So then you really show us that there is no such thing as ICC culture. In fact, that is highly contested um, and, and complex in and of itself. And so I think if, if not that we'd probably be allowed to, but if we could do some sort of ethnography of that entity itself, you know, who, who what is, is calling the shots here? Why are there these interpretations of law and politics in the court? You know, why did some interpretations fail and others don't at certain junctures? Um, I find that really fascinating because of course the ICC is constantly critiqued by myself included for being so hyper-legalized. And yet actually what's fascinating here is that it, you know, at least the pretrial chamber takes this insanely deferential political position. And so obviously we can see here that, that there are probably lots of different modes, cultural modes of how to act in the court, whether you sort of take this, you know, hyper doctrinal type of um, disposition. But here we're seeing that in fact, there's also deference to politics, but what type of politics? Because of course the court could, you know, the court, everything is political. So it could have exercised some of the type of politics in standing up to the US. Anyway, what I'm saying is, you know, there are lots of different ways of unpacking um, the ICC and its culture here. Um, and so, you know, that's why you make this great point at the end, which is that it's not just the US that's hegemonic, obviously it's the court too. And so in some ways you have this really lovely um, story to tell about um, two clashing 
hegemonic visions and then how how you how you trace them in in their relationship um so again just sort of wanting to push you um a little bit there i thought it was also really interesting to think about just think about how um you know here we've got the us failing to engage with icc um, and we've seen that before in the icj over nicaragua and recently in relation to uh Palestine and the uh, US move of its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Um, but it seems that the stakes were, you know, are different and the implications are different. So it might be interesting to see how in the past the US has, yeah, obviously, you know, been quite opposed in some ways to its um, involvement with ICJ, but it has not responded in the same way in terms of the policies enacted, um, you know, when it's felt under pressure and, and threatened. And maybe that's because of the way it, it, it understands the ICC differently, but obviously it's so much to do with the fact that it's actually individual US citizens um, who will be somehow directly affected by the ICC compared to the ICJ um, in its far more vacuous state responsibility type dimension. Um, and then uh, finally, but not finally, I mean, because it's a great piece, thanks, uh, thanks to Phoebe. And now I understand more about um, uh, plea uh, bargains um, and transformative justice. I mean, we're all familiar with notions about, you know, punitive justice versus um, reparative justice or transitional justice. But I think what Phoebe is trying to do is push it even further. And she sort of notes how there's, there's now more of a focus as well on transformative justice. So to really try to use um, the court forum or other much more interesting venues um, to, to really work through um, community harms and yeah. And have a different approach to justice um, and I think she gives a lovely sort of survey about how that might work um, through some cases in Africa um, and so I just wanted to hear from from you Phoebe a little bit as to what I mean obviously the examples you give from Uganda, Rwanda and South Africa understandably were, were largely if not exclusively localized um, and so again, we have this comparison, the local, you know, with this stuff going on in Africa, the Hague, um, this stuff going on over there. Um, to what extent do you think it is possible to, to bring the local to, to, the, to the global, to the Hague, to somewhere else? I mean, we've had, we've had attempts at that, obviously, as you mentioned, through the other um, venues, other, other avenues of victim participation. And reparations, and you note obviously that these are extremely circumscribed ways of trying to bring in um, the experiences of, of victims and their communities. But do you think there's some way of capturing these alternative processes um, in the formal setting of the ICC, or we always have this sort of division, you know, between the local, the special, the the cultural, um, and then the Hague? Because um, in some ways, obviously, I think what you're wanting is for it to be broken down but I'm just wondering how how that would actually happen um and you the three possibilities you put forward are victim participation reparations and plea negotiation and um you illustrate illustrate very well I think how plea negotiation could work so do you think that's where this focus on cultural let's call it um inclusion should should be for the ICC in the future because obviously there has been a lot of critique about how it approaches victim participation and reparations. So do you think the ICC should just put that to the side and really focus on plea negotiation or, or do you think that we should just keep focusing on actually all three um, of these dimensions? Um, and just, you know, one point again here, and Phoebe pointed out that in domestic legal settings, plea negotiation is far more familiar to um, common law jurisdictions than civil law jurisdictions. And so this in and of itself, again, is quite an interesting story to tell about how international criminal law has evolved over time to try to accommodate and take into account different European um, legal traditions, civil and common law, and how in some ways there have been battles over, you know, the legitimacy, the supremacy of uh, different contributions from those legal fields. And then in some ways then maybe this shift towards greater respect for plea negotiation is part of a broader story about, you know, the extent to which we might say that common law is becoming, you know, more culturally significant, you know, and you can then look at the personnel involved before the court and all this other stuff. And again, we can filter that down to complementarity. So um, I think that then this sort of example you give about Plea, uh, plea negotiation and thinking about how it comes from particular legal cultural traditions at the domestic level and then followed all the way through to complementarity um, could be another way of, of thinking through 
culture um, I'm probably over time but as I said I think that the key ideas here might be the tension between hierarchy and legal pluralism and then how we methodologically carry out a rich cultural study of comparativism thanks for letting me read these great chapters and thanks Casey okay great thank you very much Michelle um, I did let you go a little bit over time but I think when you have a book out there you want people to engage with it. So I think it's important that we have commentary. Um, I, I I know I need to give you, um, all three of you, a moment to respond to Michelle. So why don't we do that in the order, but try to keep it brief. That way we can open up to, to other questions for those that, that wish. And if you want to, for anyone who has a question already on their mind, if you want to type it in the chat box, then um, I can feed those through um, in, in just a little. I know everybody can read it, but that will save um, the three of you from having to read the chat box and, and that. So, um, but yeah, so if you want to go ahead and respond, we'll do the same order or if you have a preferred order you can do that um, and respond to some of the comments made by Michelle um, and then um, then we'll open up to questions okay thank you I'll, I'll kick off in order Michelle I said I was really pleased to meet you but I didn't realize we were compatriots that's a really nice surprise um, excellent points thank you so much I really enjoyed that Casey thanks for letting her continue on because I thought it was really really good insights and commentary that you provided I do want to also get to questions so I won't um, elaborate too much but you you asked me two specific questions and one was why did the court not refer to Islamic law in these cases as I outlined and this is an excellent question I asked the same thing in my PhD research about why the UN treaty bodies also don't explicitly engage with Islam and I, I've thought about this a lot, you know, was it deliberately or was it accidental? Um, does it also tie into Islamophobia that I think is now really um, prevalent, certainly in the Western world? And I think, I think there is a lack of knowledge. Certainly at the ICC, there aren't judges with Islamic expertise. So I think, you know, it's sort of a hot potato. People want to stay away from it because it is, you know, it can be a difficult uh, subject. Um, so I think there's a lack of uh, knowledge, perhaps a lack of comfort with dealing with these topics. And I think some of that is also informed a little bit about uh, the fear of Islam. And often when I present this at conferences, people will say, well, but is this not opening up Pandora's box? Are we then going to be applying Sharia law? And that doesn't go down well either. So I think it's a really important question. I think it is um, a factor, a group of factors here as to why they don't draw on it. But I think in the Al Hassan case, uh, and maybe also in the case Phoebe's working on, we're going to push the court to do so. So I don't think they can get away with avoiding it any longer. We see. Um, and what about then the second question was norm conflict. How do we deal with that? Um, also, really great question. And you ask here, is the ICC the right forum to be doing this? You also mentioned the great intra plurality within Islam. So I think here, I definitely don't want to see the ICC adjudicating Islamic law. I don't want to see them doing the interpretation or the application or developing Islamic jurisprudence because that isn't their role and that will undermine the courts rather than extend its legitimacy. So I think they do need to be careful here, but definitely partnerships with the Arab League, the, um, the OIC, things like this would, I think, be really beneficial. But as you said yourself, there is so much plurality within Islam as well. You can sort of pick within an extent what you refer to, what you don't refer to. Under Article 21, it also says that whatever the court uses has to be in compliance with international human rights law. So that also means that, you know, the court's not all of a sudden going to be amputating hands or something as part of its punishment. So I think there are some breaks or safeguards there in terms of what the court actually does refer to. Um, thank you so much. I'll follow up with you on these questions afterwards because, yeah, really great input. All right, I will go second real quick. Um, before I do, I just want to say one of our other contributors has joined us and she is, um, yeah, she's fantastic. And her, her chapter was on um, spirituality and the ICC. So really teasing through also um, the testimony that was provided and the interpretation and the judgment. So um, I just wanted to add that. Adina Nistor is also in the audience. Um, I thought that commentary was probably some of the best commentary I've ever received on something I've written. So <laughs> um, you really, you really hit all of the the tough parts about looking at this relationship um, because, yeah, it's a you know it it is comparative in many ways, uh, but it's a state and an international organization, and the power dynamics between 
between these two. Um, I loved your last comment about you know Nicaragua and and the ICJ and the U.S. reaction um, to that body is is very different to obviously its reaction to the ICC and why is that? Where I think the ICC is a very vulnerable court at the moment, um, and at that time. Uh, you know, the ICJ wasn't in that same vulnerable position. And I think the U.S. under the Trump administration really jumped on that vulnerability um, to an extent that not, I mean, even I was surprised by, the, by its actions. And um, at some point I vowed not to be ever surprised by the actions of the, uh, of the Trump administration. And yet I still was um, simply because I don't know how much people know about these sanctions regimes, but they are uh, very serious. Um, and, you know, in this case, hopefully, you know, it will likely be overturned, but in others, uh, for the other sanctions regimes that exist within the US system and, and this week, uh, now within the European system uh, for human rights, it delisting is very, very difficult. And once you're listed, I mean, you really have a very hard time operating in society. So um, it, it is very serious. And I am I respect very much the way prosecutor Ben Suda has dealt with it. Uh, but I, I really take on board this idea of legal pluralism. I wish we could go back and, and kind of weave that in more, uh, especially to the introduction, because I, I definitely think that's something that um, we could have had the authors engage with as well uh, on, on a, yeah, much more. Thank you for those comments. I, I think they were spot on. Uh, well, I guess it's it's my turn now. Brianna, are you finished? Ah, okay. Uh, oh, thank you so much, Michelle, for, for reading our chapter. I could tell that you actually spent a lot of time reading it, thinking about it. So I, that's, it's, I mean, as an academic, sometimes your work goes without being read. So it's, a, it's usually very nice for someone to have read uh, um, stuff. So you, you ask um, questions which are very important and which I think are sort of related, like to what extent is it possible to bring the local to the Hague? Like, so like say with, with Gachacha or Matukut, the, the, there's been like sort of a, a division where the local uh, happens on one hand and the formal judicial process happens on the other hand, and, and, and you're asking, can, can we can we have it together without the separation? I I I, I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know how that would work. Like I, I I ideally I think we should have it, but I'm not sure how it would work in practice. It's something maybe I have to think more about, read more about. But um, I'm not I'm not sure how. Because I mean, is it is it even desirable to to fuse these things together? Is it um, should we have um, should we? I mean, and how would that impact on the processes at the court? I, I think it raises a whole set of questions that I that are important, but that I I need to sort of interact with further to to, to be able to answer. But I, I could open it to the floor and people could suggest things. Anyone who has an idea would be, um, uh, would be, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open to suggestions, so to speak. Um, and then you ask, uh, so should we stop victim participation or reparation? I think, we, I think the three would, would happen together, ideally. So we, we maintain and improve the current victim participation and reparation regime, but we also engage in transformative uh, justice approaches at the same time. So because the, the point here is not that is not that the the current way of doing things is wrong. It's just that it's inadequate and we need to add more to it. So I would say that we do not stop the current uh, uh, victim participation and reparation, but improve it and also do the the transformative justice approaches that I've spoken about uh, at the same time. So all the three together. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, Brianne. I just wanted to make one small comment. Um, uh, Michelle mentioned organizational structure of the ICC. And I just wanted to highlight two chapters uh, in our book. One is on the judicial 
culture that exists. And I think it definitely touches on this. Uh, there is a, definitely a contentious relationship between the, you know, the approaches of the different judges. And the, I love as a court commentator to see how that plays out in different decisions. Um, but that's um, one of our chapters. Another chapter is from, by Kale Davis, and that's on prosecutorial culture to an extent of how it uses the term justice and how its projection of uh, an almost usurpation of the term justice uh, for its own specific purposes within the court. Um, so it, we we tried to also incorporate chapters that look at this like more organizational type of culture that's in cultural dynamic, I should say, uh, within the courts. Um, so check out those chapters too. Not to, not you, but others. <laughs> but, but Michelle, I, I do agree. Um, having an organizational ethnography would have been fascinating. And I used to work at the registry where, you know, there was the revision and all this other stuff that came out of it. So I had a lot of people um, wondering if we were going to delve into that. But alas, it didn't make it. <laughs> next book, then. Your next part. Take two. Take two. All right, great. Um, well, so I just want to open up the floor and to see if anyone has any comments or questions. You can raise your hand or or you can write in the chat chat box. Does anyone have any any comments they want to make? <laughs> 